It says, due to a technical problem, the following person, oh, never mind. It started, I think. Okay, yes, it did. And uh, it didn't kick Andrew. That's weird. Okay, anyways, welcome to lesson two. Technically, our first lesson in this unit that uh, I am guiding you in. Lesson one was kind of a self-directed uh, fill in the notes kind of from your readings from the textbook uh, in an attempt to try to give you all some extra time to work on your project this morning. So if you haven't done that yet, please make sure you at some point in time read through that textbook reading, give that uh, note a fill. And um, yeah, we can start with lesson two that kind of looks at the excretory system in general as a whole, we're looking at the movement in and out of water with regards to all of the lessons that we've kind of talked about how cells function and why they function the way they do and how they need that water source or that consistent amount of water to be kept in those cells to ensure that that osmosis is able to happen, right? That movement of water to maintain that water balance between internal and external environment. So it's very important that we recognize these definitions of hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic, right? Understanding the difference between all three will help us to understand why osmoregulation is a component of any and all mammals and vast majority of living organisms, regardless of where they live. But ultimately, it's very important for how we as a species live. So hopefully you're familiar with those terms. I don't want to spend too much time talking about them because they are, for the most part, review from a couple of years ago, as well as from a few lessons or units ago. So I will dive right into the idea of osmoregulation and the idea that we want to keep that interstitial fluid, which refers to the fluid that bathes our cells um, in terms of, of anything that that interstitial fluid contains. Uh, so when we think about what we're talking about with regards to solute, we're talking about those ions and we're talking about the idea that that ion is dissolved in that water, right? So osmoregulation maintains that interstitial fluid as an isotonic, as isotonic to the cytosol to maintain homeostasis. So when we think about homeostasis, again, it's that consistent idea of returning things to the normal. In this case, that interstitial fluid is isotonic with regards to the cytosol, and that is that maintained homeostatic state. When waste accumulates in blood, and specifically in mammals and animals, and specifically us, uh, it changes the concentration so it may not be isotonic to that cytosol. And again, recall that isotonic is referring to the same solute inside and outside of that cell. We want that balance. We want that balance, so to speak, right? And we're talking about those dissolved things within a liquid, right? Dissolve things within a liquid. So to maintain that osmotic pressure with what regards to water, ion and pH balance, the body must excrete or eliminate various different compounds and wastes. In mammals, we look at urea as one of the main dissolved wastes that needs to be eliminated. That's why urine has its name. And it is one of the main components of, as I alluded to, urine. So urea cannot be reused or recycled. It is a waste byproduct. When we think about entropy, I, um, I know I'm always gonna consistently harken back to this concept and idea that we've studied in this class, when we think about entropy, we think about urea as a form that just cannot be recycled or reutilized, right? When we think about other aspects of aerobic respiration, when we think about aspects of genetics, we think about re reusing and reutilizing any and everything that we can. And urea is just one of those things that cannot be reused or recycled easily by most mammals and specifically humans. So for the context of this class, I will look at the human excretory system as the main focal point. Uh, there are subtle differences between different animals, but for the sake of uh, ease and for the sake of uh, connections to what we already know quite well, I'm gonna use the human body as the main source of my anatomy for this. So the goal of the body is to rid those dissolved wastes, right? Once those dissolved wastes uh, offset the balance of that isotonic X, uh, interstitial fluid to cellular fluid, we want to get rid of those wastes within that interstitial fluid. And it's all in an attempt to maintain water balance by keeping that interst interstitial fluid isotonic to cells, equal dissolved particles, ions, what have you, within that water that surrounds all of our cells. So when we think of the different structures and we think of the different functions that those structures have, um, again, please recognize that the key thing here is that they all kind of work together. 
and that they can't really function one without the other per se. I mean, it's not a general term overall, but in general, they really need to work with each other. So blood vessels bring blood to and from the kidneys to remove that waste. The kidneys remove wastes, and we'll go over the specific details of what those kidneys, how those kidneys functions and, and, and the specific details of how it removes that waste. But they maintain that concentration within that blood and liquids in the body, helps with blood pH stabilization and return back to those homeostatic uh, measures. The ureter, it brings urine from the kidneys to the bladder. The bladder is the storage, uh, the storage sac for urine, for lack of a better words, as it's formed by the kidneys, the, the muscular bladder holds that waste product, that urine. And then the urethra is the final passageway for urine to leave the body out through uh, whichever genitals. It, it, it depends on the, the gender, the, the, the sex, I guess, of the person. But ultimately, it is that urethra that carries that waste out. So the kidneys. The kidneys are incredibly unique. The kidneys are incredibly diverse and specialized. And they're also uh, something that we have two of because of the importance of them and the redundancy of them, right? It's, it's just on the other side of on the spinal column behind. Uh, most people think kidneys are like midway through their side. They're actually more towards the spine at the back. And they receive about 25% of cardiac output or approximately 1.25 liters of blood per minute. This blood contains all of those dissolved wastes that we were talking about, and it arrives through the renal artery, is purified, and that clean blood returns to the heart via the renal vein. If you recall back from grade 11, arteries bring blood to and from place, or two places, and veins return blood back to the heart. Each kidney contains approximately 1 million nephrons, which are the functional unit that allow for that purification of blood to happen. So let's take a look at those nephrons because they are the vast majority of what we will be focusing on today. We'll be looking at the concept of what a nephron is. So I have these structures in terms of the renal pelvis, which is the interior. We're looking at the renal medulla, which is the middle part. And then the renal cortex, which is, um, which is the concept of where that a large majority of the, those nephrons are held. So when we look at the nephron that resides within that renal medulla, we're looking at a capillary network that is very, very highly connected to what's called, uh, I won't get into the specifics just quite yet, but it's connected to that, that renal cortex as well as within that renal medulla. And you really have to think about how that capillary is, is, is gonna function in, in conjunction with the systems of the, uh, with the kidney. Because when we look at the Bowman's capsule, when we look at the glomerulus, when we look at the descending loop of Henle and ascending loop of Henle, all terms that I'll get into later, uh, it's very important that we recognize the flow of liquids to and from each of those sections. And ultimately, that collecting duct is the final spot. But I'll get into more details of that after I just talk over some of the basic anatomy components. So when we think about the anatomy of the kidney and when we think about the functional aspect of the kidney and where that blood is filtered and the waste is removed, we really have to start with the idea that it, it's going to go through this Bowman's capsule, which is a incredibly, incredibly heavily innervated with blood vessels. And it's going to connect to that Bowman's capsule. And that's where a large majority of that stuff will be filtered in and out. So it, it does continuously happen throughout a lot of the process, but the, the big chunk of it happens there. The descending loop of Henle, um, which I've just uh, revealed right now, is just exactly what it sounds like. It's a descending loop, and then it continues back up through the ascending loop of Henle, and it goes through this entire network. This capillary network is always connected to the, uh, the components of that tubule that are a part of the kidney, and it's because it's, as things move in and out of that, uh, that waste receptacle, essentially, that the kidney forms, um, we want to try to, to, to remove that waste consistently and consecutively, but we also want to bring back the things that are good and that our body needs. So again, this is just an overall look at the anatomy. I'm going to go into the specifics next. So how does urine formation actually happen? Well, there are two main steps, two main steps of urine formation. The filtration component is that filtration of blood as it enters that glomerulus that I talked about, that 
Um, the Bowman's capsule, that's the start of that nephron that's responsible for filtering out the bad stuff and sending back the good stuff into our blood. So this glomerulus is going to be through what's called the afferent arteriole, and the solutes will enter through, that, enter through that Bowman's capsule, and it will start its journey into the nephron from that Bowman's capsule. So that's that filtration component I was talking about, where that blood comes in, it enters through that area into that nephron, and then that process can begin. But once it gets in there, we have to also start to think about the reabsorption component, right? The reabsorption component is where nutrients, water, ions that are in that blood that we want to that we want to keep that's where things get reabsorbed back into the bloodstream from that nephron and this occurs at various points throughout the nephron and I actually misspoke there's actually three steps the two steps for your information that i talked about are, are probably the most important one uh, but the last one that i want to talk about is that secretion um, it's not like the largest step but at different points in the nephron after that initial filtration some solutes will actually enter into that nephron so it's not as uh, big of a deal but i will bring that up a little bit later okay so let's look at the details the details of filtration and how it needs to work so with regards to how that filtration and how that blood enters that cap you really have to think about that high pressure in the glomerulus okay and that high pressure in the glomerulus forces molecules like glucose ions, amino acids, as well as water through that selectively permeable membrane that's formed by the cells of the Bowman's capsule. So it's, it's effectively super high pressure within that glomerulus, entire glomerulus, that super high pressure will force all of those things from the blood capillary that's connected directly to it. And it's going to force it through that semi-permeable membrane that is the Bowman's capsule or the beginning of that nephron. So once it's forced into the start of that nephron, it can continue along that nephron for that proper filtration process. So the cool thing about this is, is that blood cells, platelets, and plasma proteins are too large to pass through that Bowman's capsule, and so they will remain in the capillaries. The problem with that being is that if the Bowman's capsule is damaged, uh, you can start to see blood cells, platelets, and some plasma proteins pushing through those um, pushing through those Bowman's capsules, and it's usually a sign of, of something larger being an issue. So the cool thing about the, the Bowman's capsule and understanding how that works, um, uh, yeah, so that's how blood gets into urine. If there is an issue with the Bowman's capsule and it's not filtering the right amount of stuff, and sometimes it will allow blood cells, platelets, and plasma proteins to kind of get into the urine. Uh, so the numbers, this is where we look at how much blood moves through and how much liquid moves through those uh, components of the nephron. Approximately 1,400 liters of blood pass through the kidney each day, each day. When you think about how much blood you have in your body and how much actually is, is moving through it, 1,400 liters of blood pass through the kidneys each day, approximately filtering out 180 liters of fluid waste. Of this 180 fluid liters of waste, only about 1.5 liters is excreted as urine. The vast majority of, the, of those fluid wastes that go through that nephron is reabsorbed through that reabsorption process. And the kidneys filter the entire blood contents, everything, all of your blood, approximately 65 times per day. This is a very high traffic area. And as a result of it being very high traffic, it can be susceptible to damage. So when you think about some aspects of kidney damage and you think about some issues that can arise, think about it in the context of a road that gets used quite often and that road gets beat up the more it's used, right? So when it's a high, high, high traffic area, it can be very highly susceptible to damage. Okay, so we're going to look at some details of reabsorption now. That's step two. We do not form 180 liters of urine each day. That is too much urine and we would be in a lot of trouble if that was the case. Uh, but we really have to think about it in the context of there is a vast amount of filtration that's going on. So when we think about that ultra filtrate, which initially enters the proximal convoluted tubule, so that at, after that filtration happens in the glomerulus, we get into that proximal convoluted tubule. That's the next step of that nephron. And it enters that in the cortex of the kidney. And this tubule contains some ions and you know a lot of nutrients and plenty of water that the body needs to reabsorb 
before eliminating that waste. So it's going to have a specialized transmembrane, transmembrane pump that transfers sodium, that transfers chlorine, that transfers potassium. It transfers a large quantity of ions into the fluid surrounding the tubule. So we're removing, we're removing all of those ions and pumping them out of this fluid into the surrounding uh, tubule. So it's, it's incredibly, uh, or sorry, the fluid surrounding that tubule. So it's incredibly important that we recognize some of the, the similarities even of, of things that we've seen in the past that kind of pump ions in and out of, of different regions. So be mindful of that, please. So as I alluded to, uh, when we move through that aspect, we really need to be mindful of that active transport. That active transport is going to help us reabsorb useful compounds like glucose, amino acids, and it does require a great deal of energy, right? So when we talk about ATP usage, now we're really starting to look at some of the bigger ideas here. ATP needs to be utilized to transport these uh, minerals, these uh, glucose, these amino acids. It would need to be transported out of that fluid and back into those uh, that interstitial fluid surrounding the nephron. So there's a lot of energy that's going to be utilized here. So as those ions move from that proximal convoluted tubule, the filtrate becomes hypotonic. So now that filtrate is now hypotonic compared to the fluid surrounding the nephron. This causes water to move from the loop of Henle to that interstitial fluid through specialized proteins called aquaporins in that descending loop. So as that, as that filtrate moves down the descent, oh, I'll use a different color. As that filtrate moves down the descending loop, right? Because we've removed so many of those ions and so many of those, uh, so many of those ions into that interstitial fluid surrounding that nephron, this is going to cause water to flow through aquaporins and join that, those ions as a result of that hypotonic uh, concentration. So we have active transport that continues to reabsorb sodium and chlorine in the ascending loop of Henle. So now we're back up to the ascending part. Orange isn't very good, but hopefully you can see it. So now we're seeing that consistent reabsorption of sodium and chlorine in the uh, ascending loop of Henle. That filtrate is then concentrated when it reaches that distal convoluted tubule. That distal convoluted tubule is, is the part where we really see a high concentration of of, of that filtrate, which will soon become urine. And this is due to that net movement of ions and water out of the nephron. All that's really left at that point, after all those ions have left, after all that water has left, all that's really left at that point is the waste products, right? So ions will continue to be secreted into the distal tubule, ions like hydrogen and potassium. This will help balance the blood pH as needed because when you think about how all those ions that are flowing into those distal tubule areas, um, it's really going to change the pH of the blood in that region. So we have a lot of hydrogen and potassium ions that get pumped in to kind of help to balance out that blood pH needed. Again, when we think about homeostasis, we think about how balance needs to be restored. And this is controlled by a hormone called aldosterone, and it's secreted by the adrenal glands. So when you think about where the adrenal glands are, uh, just above your kidneys, it's important to recognize that they work together in conjunction. So as ions leave the nephron, water will continue to be reabsorbed to maintain that, obs uh, that osmotic balance. So again, water absorption and, and again, that balance as the ions leave that nephron that towards that distal end, we're going to continue to see that water be reabsorbed to follow those ions in an attempt to bring that osmotic balance. So now we are at towards the end, and we have a very concentrated filtrate reaching the collecting duct, and this is now called urine. So the collecting duct contains more aquaporins in, uh, towards the end of this nephron cycle. So as the waste moves downward towards that medulla component, right, the medulla being, oops, here, as that waste continues to move down through the collecting duct, and it moves into the medulla of the kidney, it becomes even more concentrated before arriving at that bladder because again, we're looking at more aquaporin proteins, more water being pumped out, increase that concentration. So in the collecting duct, there are some small am amounts of urea that are reabsorbed back into the blood. This helps to maintain the concentration gradient needed for reabsorption of water to continue because by now at this point in the collecting duct, 
we've removed 99.9% of ions, proteins, amino acids. The only thing that we can now pull back into the body that will allow for osmotic balance to be restored and water to follow it is the leftover urea. So as some urea is pulled back into the body, the water will then continue to, um, to flow back into that interstitial space and out of the nephron. So now let's take a look at some of the specifics of how some of these systems work, because while we are at stage three technically, I want to stop and I want to look at some of the aspects of that aquaporin as well as antidiuretic or diuretic hormone or ADH. Um, these are going to be, we're going to talk about how they are working together to kind of help control the water flow in and out of your kidney. So aquaporins are controlled by that ADH. This is a hormone that is made by the hypothalamus, which you kind of learned about in lesson one. And hypothalamus is a part of the brain that's responsible for controlling water levels within the body. So ADH encourages the aquaporins to reabsorb water in the nephron and the collecting duct. And so when there's lots amount, large amounts of ADH, there's going to be large amounts of activation of those aquaporins, so water will be reabsorbed. Now, there is a problem with that. ADH levels, and specifically the hypothalamus in general, is quite impacted by some external factors, mainly caffeine and alcohol. So the caffeine and alcohol can inhibit ADH production and inhibit the uh, binding of ADH to those aquaporins. And this causes a loss in water uh, as a result of it not being reabsorbed. So causing less water to be reabsorbed by the kidneys and ultimately to be excreted as waste, even though it's not. So those of you who drink large amounts of coffee, myself included, um, you'll notice that if you continue to drink large amounts of coffee throughout the day, uh, that you're going to continue to go to the washroom quite often because, again, that caffeine inhibits ADH. And as a result of that, water is less likely to be reabsorbed in the kidneys and leaves via that waste. So this is going to cause dehydration due to the inhibition of that anti-diuretic hormone. Oop, I think I forgot one other point. Nope, we're okay. So let's take a look at the summary of the kidney as a whole, specifically with regards to those nephrons. And we'll look at the structure and the major function and just kind of break it down before we move on. So the glomerulus has a large uh, connection to blood vessels that lead into the Bowman's capsule. And that Bowman's capsule will then be a semi-permeable structure where blood solutes enter the nephron and the process of filtration uh, can begin. That proximal convoluted tubule is the first stop. That's where reabsorption of nutrients like glucose and amino acids, as well as ions are, are there uh, to be reabsorbed in that proximal convoluted tubule. And it also, start, it also helps with the secretion of hydrogen ions to maintain that pH, to maintain that balance. So when you think about hydrogen ions and all of the functions that it performs in the human body with regards to ATP generation, with regards to now uh, balancing blood pH within the proximal convoluted tubule, you're really starting to see how important hydrogen ions are within the body. So now from that proximal convoluted tubule, it moves to the descending portion of the loop of Henle. And in that, we continue to see reabsorption of water. And it's through that special protein called aquaporin, which are controlled by that antidiuretic hormone. And then as that water is removed, we go back up to the ascending portion of the loop of Henle, where we're looking at continued reabsorption of those ions by protein channels. We then get to the distal convoluted tubule where there is even more reabsorption of sodium and chlorine, as well as that continued secretion of hydrogen ions and potassium ions that the proximal convoluted tubule was performing. And then lastly, when we get to the collecting duct, we're looking at the further reabsorption of water, as well as that small amount of urea, because we've removed all those ions um, into the uh, interstitial fluid, as well as further secretion of hydrogen ions. Uh, the descending portion of the loop of Henle is an interesting component because it's only really responsible for reabsorption of water through those aquaporins. The descending loop of Henle has the largest concentration of aquaporins than any other uh, part of the, um, of the nephron. So that's really the main source of water reabsorption will happen in that, happen in that descending loop of Henle. Uh, so the ion components are really for before and after, not so much in the descending loop of Henle. So that's a good overview of the structures and the functions of those structures for stages one and two. Now we'll just finish up with regards to the details of secretion because this is uh, the component of 
of waste removal that we're really looking at that blood and interstitial fluid being filtered and the leftover pieces and bits are going to be the urine that's left over. So when we think about all of the different components that are in urine, um, we really need to consider what has been put in to that urine. So we think about hydrogen ions and some bicarbonate ions. Again, we're looking at maintaining that homeostatic pH level of, of urine. We're looking at potassium ions. These are gonna be later discussed in nerve signaling. Um, but when we think about all the different waste products that will happen as a result of that, potassium ions are one of them. We're looking at detoxified poisons from the liver. We're looking at byproducts of water soluble drugs like penicillin, any type of pharmaceutical, any type of vitamin, any type of daily vitamin that you take en masse that exceeds the body's ability to filter it out. Uh, you're essentially urinating it out. So anyone who takes a multivitamin consistently in the day, um, unfortunately, if their body isn't re-upping on those vitamins naturally as well, uh, you're going to excrete a lot of that uh, vitamin out in your urine. So once filtrate reaches the idea, uh, or sorry, reaches the collection ducts, it's called urine. And then when that urine reaches the bottom of the collecting duct, it is about four times more concentrated than the interstitial fluid that it passes uh, through. So it will pass from there to that renal pelvis ureter and then be stored in the bladder for later final passage out through the urethra. Um, yes, aquaporin is the main water reabsorption protein that we look at. So lastly, I just want to go briefly over some dysfunctions of the kidney that may arise as a result of different things. Um, it's important to recognize these. I may or may not ask any questions on the quiz with regards to this. Uh, so just think about some of the aspects. Chances are, I don't think I do. Um, I'll double check with you all on that later. But with regards to the kidneys, they're really, really important to the purification process of large amounts of waste and reabsorption of water and other important minerals and nutrients. Uh, so as a result of that, they can be highly susceptible to damage. Uh, so when you look at that urine urine urinalysis, which is the analysis of the contents of urine, uh, in terms of the concentrations of solutes, we can determine an awful lot based on uh, what's going on in a person's body based on the concentrations of those solids. So I'm not going to spend too much detail on this, uh, but I will encourage you to look at the different types of kidney diseases, a description of that disease, and then what would happen as a result of your analysis. Um, because like I said, I don't think I ask any questions and uh, I will triple check you on that uh, later, but we don't really talk about the diseases components too, too much in this class because normally we would do a project on it. Um, but you already have enough on your plate. So again, have a read through that. Uh, this kind of concludes our lesson here. So please take a look at the homework sections and I will answer any and all questions that we have in the chat.